Hello folks, I hope you're having a good day today. Hey, today I want to take a look at the next story um, in the sort of Cthulhu Mythos October that I've set aside for you all. Um, and today I'm going to take a look at a South African piece, um, The Treatment of Mwa, by Donald Wandre. And so we'll take a look at it and so forth in the story that he published. And this was published at the same time... Um, uh, in the first generation, at the same time, uh, Cthulhu uh, Mythos was being created and written by H.P. Lovecraft. And while Lovecraft was still alive, I consider it to be a very strong, strong story. It's also set in a place that we don't typically go to in the Cthulhu Mythos of Saharan Africa. Um, it's not a place that's commonly visited with stories and so forth. So it's fun to take a look at it. I just finished Wing Death for you um, and so forth. Now, basically what I'm doing is, is I'm taking basically a full Saturday uh, here as, as we enter... Um, October, I'm basically taking an entire Saturday out of my life to record a bunch and research a bunch of these videos. Um, I'll probably try to knock out 15 or 20 of them by the end of the day today. I think this is my 14th I've done today so far. Um, I'm, probably, I'm about nine hours in already. <laughs> anyway, that's my, 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 my goal today is to knock out a whole bunch of these for you um, and just take it aside um, and research them and put them together for you and so forth. And I do enjoy the treatment of Embois so much because, I, first of all, I think it's a lost classic. Uh, Donald Wandre's works were not serialized early on in a lot of Cthulhu Mythos stuff. So when you were reading, you know, Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos that was put together, um, uh, that kind of canonized or brought together a lot of these sort of early works, like The Hounds of Tindalos by Frank Belknap Long or something like that, it wasn't included. Um, or some of August Dirtle's stuff, it was not often included because Donald Wandre's stuff, he oftentimes held on to it more uh, strongly. It's fine, I don't have any issues with the guy. Um, but you oftentimes won't be familiar with it as a result. And this is such a strong story. I'll link you to a collection where you can check it out uh, below. I do think that this is the best work by Donald Wandre I've read. Now, to be fair, I've only read like two-thirds of his works. So just take that with a caveat and so forth. I have done a work for you already, a Fire Vampires. You can check that out and so forth. I'll actually link that to you below in my comments. But um, that, So you, if you want to review that after watching this out. But Donald Wandre is a very interesting guy. Um, he's wrote on about 30 or some short stories during the pulp era, a few stories afterwards, here and there, and so forth. Um, but he, but most of his work was done then. Although they'll take on more of an editing role, he co-founded Arkham House with uh, August Derleth and so forth in order to keep uh, the dream alive um, and keep publishing and putting out uh, Lovecraft. And then later on, some other pulp writers and such. Uh, they'll put out stuff like Cave and Jaco Jacoby and stuff like that too. Um, that are also being republished. Um, that were big names during that time too. That are being sort of trying trying to bring them back and keep them alive for the masses. And it's definitely the reason why uh, we know who H.P. Lovecraft is today. So thanks to Donald Wandre for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Good job, buddy. Now, let's take a look at the treatment of Embois, who I think is his, like I said, I think it's his classic, his strongest story by far. So let's take a look at it. And also, it's only like 20 pages long, so it won't take you that long to read in most of my collections that I've read it in. So anyway, let's take a look. So basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking, uh, we're in a dive bar in off the Gold Coast in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and so forth. And basically we're going to find our main character, our point of view character, um, has arrived and so forth. He's looking for some help. He wants to, he's trying to set up an expedition to head uh, past the Congo and into the local mountains of the moon, uh, which are there. And he wants to head up there. He believes there's going to be an opportunity for some strong sort of uh, geologic uh, expeditions, mining opportunities, oil, and so forth. And just for context, uh, the Congo is definitely rich with those sorts of things. Uh, it's one of the, it's one of its strongest resources the DRC has and other nearby areas have. It's definitely, and it's always been strong with those sorts of things. So, so so he's there, he's trying to set up an expedition uh, to go inland to the mountains of the moon and so forth and kind of take a, to unpack it. And there's a local person there who has, um, who's missing two of his legs um, and deeply, deeply bandaged and so forth. Uh, and he says, you don't want to head on up there uh, and so forth. Uh, he's a white guy, a fellow, um, one, of, one of the few white people in the local area. Um, and he says he, he was a geologist, um, just like you, um, and so forth. And he had an, an ill-fated expedition. And the guy asked him what happened. And so he tells him the story of uh, what happens. And so we're going to hear the story uh, It's being told by the person who experienced it um, to the person who's our point of view character. So we're going to be following this this um, geologist. So we'll talk about this geologist and the geologist is going to give his story. He was setting up for an expedition again to, to take a look at some oil, some local rocks and so forth and put together some an expedition and so forth. They headed up to the mountains of the moon relatively safely uh, with a number of locals as guides and so forth. They got to an area um, and they split up to go to some additional areas and so forth. Him and a group of uh, locals got to a place with this unusually shaped hill. When they arrived at this hill, the people said, this is the place of Embois. They won't go any further. His magic is very strong in this, up and around this hill. Uh, and so forth. Um, he camps the night, and in the morning, they've all fled. And so forth. So he heads on in. 
checks that out uh, and so forth. He does see a small copse of trees uh, that are there uh, that seem to surround, just about 20 trees or so, that seem to surround, of uh, the various sizes, um, but, but they're kind of humanoid in shape. And so he walks over to the area, he sees this unusual shape in the middle of this, this meadow where these trees are kind of around, uh, and it's kind of changing. It's a, it's a cube, it's a sphere, it's a, uh, a pyramid. It just keeps changing shapes from shape to shape to shape to shape to shape from this object. And uh, our, our, our point of view character, um, the geologist, sees these um, two eyes, human eyes, that seem to be peering out from him from one of the human trees uh, and so forth as he's looking over there. And um, it distracts him, and then he is attacked by a, uh, a local uh, black man. It seems like there's really old, ancient black man uh, from the area. Um, and then he tries to shoot him and so forth. It's unable to do so. The man overpowers him, knocks him out, and then forces a drug down his stomach and so forth. And when he comes to, he sees that he's become one of the tree people, um, as one, one of the trees. He, he's literally grown into a tree um, around it and so forth. And he's starting to become more and more like a tree. The one person who's over to his is still not fully turned into a tree yet um, and tells him basically the story of what's happening. Uh, this guy here, Ambois, has been here for millennia in this area. Um, he's taken over the, the corpse of, uh, of an old black person who died centuries ago and so forth. And he keeps this area um, for some unknown reason that uh, n none of the people here are able to figure out. Um, so basically, he'll turn people into trees and so forth. Um, and so basically what's going to end up happening is as after being turned into this tree-like tree person, and, and he can find feel himself growing more and more tree-like, um, then a scientist is going to come over who is from another one of our expeditions, um, is going to attack, is going to be attacked by the corpse as he comes over to find out what's happening and find out, track down the person who went missing in his expedition. And he've, um, he's been, he's attacked by the corpse. He shoots the corpse. The corpse isn't damaged by it. He takes out a machete, hacks off its head, um, and, and, and takes it out. Um, then comes over and uses it and hacks off, um, the, the tree bottom, uh, and so forth, and takes starts to take um, his friend with him, uh, who is who is um, who's the head of his el el the ill-fated expedition out this way. He's attacked by the corpse again and has to take it out a second time. This time he hacks it in half, um, and so forth. Um, on the way back, he catches malaria and dies, so he's never able to fully recover, and so forth. But his friend, uh, the geologist who's telling the story, is able to get back to safety and so forth and he stays here he's never returned home to europe because he's now lost his two legs he was hacked off um below uh where but so, so too low for his legs and so so forth so he was hacked off and lost his legs and so forth and so obviously our our character to whom he's telling this to in, the, in this bar in this dive in this gold coast doesn't believe it and so forth and the man in in, in 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 anger says you don't believe it believe this and he pulls back his bandages and he shows these trees are glowing up and bloody stumps uh and he says i have to cut them every day uh and so forth or else i turn back into a tree um and so that's the end of the story now normally i won't go all the way to the end of the story but i think it's important to do it here because my comments about why this story is different and so strong won't make a sense if you don't have the last two pages, <laughs> which I just went over for you. Um, but that's okay. One thing that ends up happening, though, is that this is a body horror story. And as you see from the last couple of pages, this is a body horror story. Um, and body horror is not something you typically see in a Cthulhu mythos. The Cthulhu mythos typically is more, is bigger um, as a picture of horror. Uh, what's happening is bigger uh, and so forth. But the idea here is incredibly strong. <laughs> an incredibly interesting one and the body horror and the the last few pages are done so well and so perfectly well and the pacing here is good the story is good the, the characters are developed well and so forth um now i do wish we'd gotten a little more with Ambois. who is Ambois? why is he here what's that object you know and so forth i i i you know i like that wandre was able to to, to, to not use mythos elements here heavily. He doesn't talk about, you, you know, he doesn't name drop Cthulhu. He doesn't have the, the, the natives talk about how this is, you know, how Amboise, you know, the physical manifestation of 
you know, Nile Sotep or something. Uh, you know, I, and I appreciate that, that we're not getting a deep dive into all things, you know, Cthulhu mythos ish. In fact, there are no elements that are mentioned here at all. It's just a Cthulhu mythos story and the fact that it takes place in the Cthulhu mythos world. And that makes it such a strong story. It's meant to be in the Cthulhu mythos story. It uses some things obliquely, but it never name calls anything. And I love that. It's very similar to Robert E. Howard's The Black Stone uh, or The Thing on the Roof that never name calls anything from the Cthulhu Mythos, but definitely has Cthulhu Mythos elements in it, it was intended to be so. And is absorbed in it by later writers of the Cthulhu Mythos too, just like the treatment of Embois, uh, and so forth. And so I love that fact that that happens. It's such a great story, um, and so forth. It's able to live and breathe on its own, and a good writer leaves you wanting more. And Donald Wandre in this story definitely leaves you wanting more. And I, yeah, I consider this to be his best story I've written. Or, or I've written <laughs> his best story he wrote, uh, the best story that I've read so far, um, out of about two-thirds of his stories that I've read. So there it is. Check it out. Let me know what you think about it. I'll give you a link to it, probably in a collection. I'm happy to engage with it further if you've read it um, or if you're familiar with the treatment uh, and so forth. Do you agree or disagree? Do you, did you like the body horror element in this story? I'm happy to engage with it further um, or the endings um, and such. Um, if you think body horror was done better somewhere else, I'm also happy to talk about that uh, in, in the mythos specifically. I'm also happy to talk about that um, uh, about with more in the comments below and such. Um, and also, if there's some elements you want to talk about too. Let me know. And hey, uh, if you like this video, please feel free to hit that subscribe button because I'm bringing to you, trying to bring to you a lot of these sort of classics of science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Um, and the treatment of Embois is a perfect example of a forgotten classic of horror. I think it's a forgotten classic of the Thule Mythos. Um, so anyway, so there you are. Take a look at it. Let me know what you think about it. And then also, hey, if you spent all your time watching this video I, and all the way here to the end, hey, I, I just want to take a moment and thank you for it because we all have busy days, busy lives, and so many things that happen in our lives. So the fact that you spent this time with me, that's very humbling, and I appreciate that. So thanks again.